we continue today our series of messages from the letter to John, today's scripture is found in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. 1 John 4, 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brother or sister are liars, for those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you took up this worship material today, you expected to hear a sermon. Notice that I didn't say you were looking forward to hearing a sermon or that you would have been disappointed if there had not been one, but still you expected that I or someone else would take a passage of Scripture and expound on it in what we call a sermon or a message or a homily or a meditation, what children tell me is simply a long, long talk. By the way, some adults tell me the same thing. What you may not have considered, though, even as you were expecting this sermon, was what it would be about. Like the spouse who is simply content and has enough sense not to ask his partner why she fixed whatever it was she fixed for dinner, but was content simply to have it laid before him. So you may be content simply to have some sermon preached without much consideration about exactly what it would be. Still, there are a couple of anticipatory questions that you might ask before hearing a sermon. Is this going to be for me, or is it going to be for us? Conceding that the answer could be both, most sermons fall into one of those two categories. Some sermons are about your personal faith. How will it help me to live a better life? How will I live my Christianity out in the world? While others are about our collective life. What should we be as a church, and how can I accept my responsibility for what the church will be? It is my casual and unscientific observation that a disproportionate number of sermons today fall into that first category. It is about me, and I think that has to do something with our market approach to ministry. We are often so desperate to ensure that the institution survives that we are willing to do anything to get people to come to church. And so we try to figure out what it is they want, and that is what we give them. Obviously, that runs counter to Jesus' admonition that we are to give up our lives for the world and that we are to live our lives in self-sacrifice. The gospel is not simply for us. It is for us to serve others. That is not to say, of course, that we shouldn't preach sermons or shouldn't listen to sermons about our personal life. After all, we live most of our life not in church, but out in the world. It is it is as individual Christians that we have the most impact on the world. And so we should concern ourselves in church with what it is like to live our lives as Christians individually.
Still, it is in church that we learn how to be Christians. It is here that we grow in our Christian faith, where others model Christianity for us, where we are encouraged to live out our faith in the world. And as Paul reminded us, though each one of us has our own part to play in the body of Christ, it is together that we are the body of Christ. And so that is the thing with which we should most consider ourselves. How can we be the church of Jesus Christ? There are probably no groups of people that think about this more than ministers do. I am connected with a couple of groups of ministers. One is a peer group that is made up of ministers who are all Baptists who pastor churches much like ours. There is another group, however, the interfaith group in the John Creek community that has another Baptist in it and several other Protestants, but also has a Jewish rabbi and a couple of Muslim imams. While we may in many ways differ in our approaches to ministry, in our theology, and in our attitudes toward faith in general, we have a number of things in common, and so our conversations are often quite lively. You can imagine what this last year has been like for us in our conversations with one another. It has been a lot about uh, how are you keeping your church going in this anything but normal time? What platforms are you using for your services before you can get back to being together? Uh, how has that changed your preaching or your services? What are you doing now to decide about whether or not to go back inside? And if you have decided to do so, what safety precautions are you putting in place? What are your protocols? How are your offerings holding up during this time? These are the kinds of things that we talk about a lot. And when you think about them, they are mostly about how are we going to survive during this very difficult and challenging period for the church? But now, as we hope, we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We believe, we believe there is some possibility that sometime fairly soon we'll be able to return to what we might call normal, some sense of the way things ought to be. The conversations have taken a different turn. It has more to do with what the future of the church will be. What will it look like? What will we retain from what we have changed during this time of the pandemic? Uh, what will survive that needs to survive, but what will have been lost that we will really miss? Basically, how will things have changed during this time, and what people will come back, and which ones will stay away? And if you think about all those questions, and if you are in those conversations, you will sense the overarching themes are fear and anxiety, which are basically the same things. We are worried about the future of the church. This, of course, is not the first time that this has happened. In fact, in our passage today, in John's first letter, he is addressing a group of people that are very fearful about their future. This is obviously in the time before the church has become this mass institution with institutional uh, expression in every continent, basically in every country. It is long before the time when one might have thought that there was no way that the church could ever disappear. The Christians are huddled up in little groups and they are concerned about their survival. And the writer of 1 John says that there's no reason for that. We should not fear that instead we should simply love because it is love that casts out fear. He says that there is no fear in love. Throughout the years after that, however, there are plenty of times when the church was fearful, and those were never the best times of the church. The church has always been its least attractive when it was bathed in anxiety. Fear causes us to become desperate, and when we're desperate, we do terrible things. It was desperation that caused the Inquisition. It was people who were fearful who burned others at the stake because they were afraid of the messages that they had which are different from their own. And even in our own more enlightened age, it is fear that far too often causes us to do the things that we do. When we are fearful about the, the future of the church, we tend to throw all of our energy and all of our money, whatever we have of those things, at trendy programs in the hope that those things will help us to survive. Or worse than that, we may blame other people or our denomination or something else for the decline in the church. Or we may look longingly at evangelical churches that are growing and throw out whatever traditions we might have in order to do things that they, the same way they are doing. 
some pious individuals might argue that there have always been times in the church when it was seeking to be prophetic that people wouldn't listen to them. And maybe it is simply that the message that we have for the world today is just too tough. And because of that, people are going away from the church. But whatever anxiety we have, whatever fear we might have about the future of the church, and no matter how much hand-wringing or navel-gazing we do, people are still in the midst of that, leaving the church. While we are anxious, they have gone on to do other things, finding that they had other things to do with their Sunday morning, reading the paper or watching a kid's softball game to be too concerned about what was going on in the church at that time. They didn't leave in a huff, they just drifted away. And there is little to be gained by pointing at empty pews and saying, isn't it awful? And there's even less to be gained by, in the midst of that, being afraid of it and worrying about what might happen to the institutional church or to our own church in particular. Instead, we need to do what the church has always done when it sought to be the church of God, and that is to focus on our mission. And to focus on our mission is to focus on the one who gave it to us. And the writer of the letters of John says that that is a God that we can trust because it is a God of love. Many people think of God as being fear. Others say that God is light. The Bible says that God is love, simply that. When God creates, God does it out of love. When God rules, it is out of love. When God judges, it is out of love. God simply loves. God cannot do anything else but love. And the writer of 1 John tells us that we too are to love and to abide in the love of God. That if we live inside that love, then there should be no fear for us because that focuses us on the mission that we have before us. And so we immerse ourselves in that love. When you think about it, there is no reason that the church should have survived for over 20 centuries. There were too many political and intellectual and social reasons that it should have disappeared. Too many pressures were on it from the outside. And worse than that were the dissension and the ineptitude and the self-centeredness of the church on the inside. If it were up to us, the church would have fallen away a long time ago. It would simply have been an institution of the past. In fact, the only reason that the church continues to survive today is because Jesus Christ has chosen to use that as a means of sharing his love with the world. There are certainly plenty of other ways that he has, could have done it, but through Christ, God has chosen to love the world through us, and that is the reason that it survives, only because we have given up our futures, only because we have given up ourselves to do what Christ would have us to do. And so we immerse ourselves in the baptismal waters and in doing that, we come up as new creatures, having died to ourselves so that we might live for Christ. We have many of the ancient liturgies of the church, especially the baptismal liturgies, and they were basically funeral services. They did that so that the early Christians could get dying out of the way. They needed to be reminded that once they had done that, there was nothing left to fear. And so they would take off their old clothes as a symbol of leaving their old lives behind, and then they would go down in the baptismal waters where the minister would say as they were immersed as if, as, as if they were being baptized, dying with Christ. And then as they were raised up, rising again to walk again in newness with Christ. It was a reminder that their old lives had been left behind and therefore they had nothing to fear. The tragic irony for the church today is that we are worried about our future when the future should not be our concern at all. After all, after we have died, there is nothing left that can be done with us. We don't have to be concerned about our futures. We only have to be concerned with keeping up with Christ. It is a good thing that on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he did not place at that time the church in the hands of the disciples because they were nothing if they were not afraid. They were desperately afraid about their own futures. And just as we would have been, it would have caused them to do desperate things. Basically what they did was to flee in fear of their lives. But Jesus Christ was determined to keep his spirit alive through them. And so on that night, he gave them a rite, a ceremony they could use whenever they were afraid, whenever they forgot what it was all about. 
whenever they did not remember that they were to die with Christ, he gave them that last supper. And so I pass on to you what has been passed on to me, what has been passed down from the time of the Apostle Paul, who said that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Eat you all of it. And in the same way also, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. I tell you, I will not drink it anew until I drink it with you in the kingdom of heaven. Drink you all of it. We take part in this, not because we're perfect, but because we're aware that we're not. Not because we feel that we must, but because Jesus invites us to do it. And when we do, it is not simply the taking of the elements. It is the reminder that Christ is always with us. Christ, the representative of the love of God, Christ causes us never to fear. Let us pray. Forgive us of our fears, O Lord, and cast them out. And fill us instead with your love. Help us to abide in that love and to share it with all whom we meet. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.